Great, thank you, Carson. That's a really a nice introduction. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, it's really a pleasure and an honor to be here uh, speaking to you today. Uh, it's such a great forum of, of uh, people, researchers, students doing uh, work, interesting work, great work on exercise in the brain, and uh, and uh, just been a great a great meeting for me. Um, there's many perspectives on aging, uh, some of which are a bit more positive than others. Uh, some people focus more on the experience of getting older, the uh, wisdom associated with getting older. Uh, Robert Frost once wrote, the afternoon knows what the morning never suspected. There are, however, alternative views of aging, some not so uh, not so nice. When I was younger, I could remember anything, whether it had happened or not. But my faculties are decaying now, and soon I shall be so I cannot remember any but the things that never happened. It is sad to go to pieces like this, but we all have to do it. Mark Twain. Mark Twain, uh, in, his, in his funny, humorous way, uh, points out something that is is a perspective, it's a view that a lot of people hold, that the consequences, the cognitive and memory consequences of getting older are in some way inevitable. They're, they're going to happen to all of us. We all have to experience this. And I'd like to raise the question here as to whether it really is inevitable. Is it as, as ubiquitous as some people think it is? Um, and this is a, an, important, an important question. And in fact, there's some reason to have some hope. In fact, when we look at individual variability, ind individual differences in, um, in the way that the brain ages, we see quite a bit of variability. So here I put up on the screen nine brains. These are nine different individuals. When we look across these nine brains, can we, even if we don't have any expertise in this area, can we pick out those that are older. So you look across, let's look across these three, the top panel here. The brain looks pretty normal, kind of what you see in a textbook. The ventricles are normal size, everything looks pretty good. So it's probably not too surprising to hear that this, these three individuals, their average age is 22. This group of brains, these three individuals, look quite a bit different significantly more atrophy, ventricles that are much larger than they are here. You don't really need to be a specialist in the field to notice the differences between these three brains and these three brains. The average age of these three individuals is 72. However, let's look down at these three brains. Maybe something, maybe a bit in the middle, maybe not as tightly packed of tissue up here. Uh, maybe the ventricles are a little bit larger. If we're thinking linearly, we might expect maybe somewhere in middle age, maybe somewhere between 22 and 72. In reality, these three individuals here are actually the same mean age as these three individuals here. There is significant individual variability, and we see this, we can quantify this. This is just a, a, a visual illustration of the type of variability, but we can quantify, we can, we can plot these data out. And for an example, if we look here at the hippocampus, the hippocampus sits in the medial temporal lobe. It's critically involved in memory formation. If you damage the hippocampus, you experience amnesia. Those people, older people who show changes, deterioration and atrophy, shrinking of the hippocampus, they usually start, start to experience some memory problems which leads to uh, Alzheimer's disease or uh, uh, usually that form of dementia. And in fact, when we plot out the data, we see uh, relative stability in the size of this structure up until about 50 years of age and then there's gradual decline after that. Normal age-related decline after the age of 50 is usually somewhere between 1 and 2% per year. 
we start looking at people with Alzheimer's disease, this rate increases to somewhere between 3 and 5% per year. So we see this decline in the size of the hippocampus. Here's another region, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, involved in a lot of higher order cognitive functions, working memory, your ability to selectively attend items in your environment, ignore uh, irrelevant information. This area also shows significant changes and, and shrinking and atrophy with age. But you notice that the, the function is quite a bit different. It's more of a linear function, showing decline, starting to show decline almost as soon as it reach, reaches a point of maturation, about the age of 30. Um, and, uh, but when you look across, coming back to the point about individual variability, look at the variability here. Look at the variability here. When we, when we take a few people like um, this individual here who's about 70 years of age, they have the size of the prefrontal cortex equivalent to somebody much younger. This person who's also um, about the same age, about 70 years of age, they have the size of the prefrontal cortex equivalent to somebody much older. We see similar types of variability in the hippocampus and in other areas. So we can ask the provocative question. What factors explain this type of variability? Is this just methodological error? Is this uh, just uh, uh, people who are genetically lucky, genetically fortunate, and they've been able to age more successfully and gracefully than others? Or have they done something throughout their lifespan that's allowed them to show less brain atrophy than, their, than some of their peers? And this is, This is really where physical activity emerges onto the scene. So in the title of my presentation, I use the word brain plasticity. What do we mean by brain plasticity? And it's a, a commonly used term. It's a term that is uh, uh, flung around in academic circles, uh, but it's a very difficult term to define. And in fact, um, uh, quite often you hear this term being used differently in different circles. If you're, if you're coming from uh, a literature focused on traumatic brain injury, you might be using brain plasticity differently than you are if you're coming from uh, an animal uh, lab. And, uh, and so the term brain plasticity is very complex. But in general, we mean some positive, generally it's used in, in the, the connotation is generally a positive adaptation to some environmental uh, stimulus and sometimes that can be um, a, a, some damage to the head or some uh, damage to the brain tissue and, and then the brain has to adapt. And um, I usually like to think about brain plasticity uh, in the context of silly putty. And we often, uh, years ago, there used to be a thought that um, that the older adult brain was incapable of really uh, being very plastic, that it wasn't very plastic. It was, it was, if you damage it or if something happens, it's kind of like a, a rock. And if you damage it, you chip off a piece of the rock, you're not getting anything back. You're not remolding that rock into something else. But we now know that that's, that's really a, a simplistic perspective on brain plasticity in, in older adulthood. Um, that being said, we do know that the brain is, seems to be more plastic in children. And as we get older, uh, the idea of brain plasticity, that we can mold the brain, we can shape the brain, it's malleable. We can, we can have an impression on the brain and that this changes, the, the capability of the brain to adapt and change like this changes throughout the lifespan. And in fact, there's some good evidence that children will recover more, more fully and quickly than older people when there's some damage. So there's some good evidence that children have more plastic brains. But does that mean that older adults lose their capacity for plasticity? I don't think so. And in fact, coming back to Silly Putty. We all know Silly Putty. When you crack open that freshly, fresh new egg of Silly Putty, it's a warm, nice piece of Silly Putty, right? It's moldable, malleable. You can shape it. You can twist it. It's a very plastic. Our brains, when we're young, are like that freshly opened egg of Silly Putty. As we get older, 
Our brain might be like that silly putty that sits out a little too long. Everyone knows what I'm talking about, right? It starts to become a little bit hard, less impressionable, less moldable, less malleable. But, but all of us know as well, if you pick up that silly putty and you start to hold it, you start to warm it up, you start to play with it in your hands a bit, what happens? You gain back some of that plasticity. You can start to use it to make an impression, to, to mold it, and, and to reshape it. And so the older adult brain, I think, is kind of like that, that, that egg of silly putty that's been sitting out a little too long. It's still capable of plasticity, but we just have to do maybe a little bit more in order to take advantage of that plasticity. So this is where physical activity really emerges on the scene. And we know a lot from human neuroimaging studies about the impact of physical activity on brain outcomes. That being said, we still have a lot left to learn. And so what I'm going to talk about today is what we know uh, in general about the impact of physical activity on brain outcomes in older adults. I'm not going to really talk too much about the impact in, in other populations. Um, and, uh, and at the end, towards the end of my talk, I'm going to be referring to some of the gaps in our knowledge and where we really need to focus some of our, of our new research. So let me start out talking about some cross-sectional associations. And by cross-sectional, I mean taking a single snapshot. We measure somebody's physical activity, whether we're doing it uh, through self-report or objectively. We may uh, take somebody's cardiorespiratory fitness levels, just take a snapshot of their fitness levels, and then examine how that is correlated with different brain measures. And there's many different ways of, of using neuroimaging. One of, the, one of the benefits of neuroimaging is that in an hour, one hour scan, you can capture information about the morphology and volume and thickness of regions. We can get information about white matter microstructure. We can get information about the functioning of different regions and how different regions communicate or are functionally connected. We can get information about um, different metabolites, uh, the concentration of different metabolites in, in areas. So we can get a lot of information. So the field, of course, doesn't embark right away on RCTs. You want to develop and you want to show cross-sectional uh, associations first. And this is really where the field uh, started out. So this is a, a result. Uh, published in 2014 using in 310 people using um, more of an objectively measured uh, assessment of physical activity and what they found was a modest but significant association between uh, greater amounts of moderate intensity physical activity and uh, hippocampal volume and uh, this association uh, this association between moderate intensity physical activity and hippocampal volume significantly mediated, or hippocampal volume significantly mediated the association between physical activity and better memory function. So this was an important study because it, it was one of the early ones to demonstrate that objective measures of physical activity where we can, where we can uh, describe and, and characterize light forms of physical activity versus more moderate intensity forms of physical activity is associated with hippocampal volume. There's been other studies examining measures of fitness. So for an example, in 2009, we published a study with 165 adults that we collected between 59 and 81 years of age. They were all free of dementia. Uh, during our assessment, um, we did uh, collected aerobic fitness on them, and we did an MRI. And during the MRI session, we were able to isolate, locate the hippocampus, and, uh, and segment it from the rest of the brain. What we found was a very clear and striking association. So people with higher fitness levels over here had larger hippocampal volumes than their lesser fit peers. This effect is cross-sectional. It's a correlation. It remains significant even when statistically controlling for age, sex, education, and intracranial volume. But it's a correlation, right? It's a correlation. We cannot make any causal claims about this. We cannot say that engaging in physical activity or increasing cardiorespiratory fitness levels actually modifies the size of the hippocampus. We can't say that from any of this data, but it is provocative. It's interesting that this region, which is so critically involved in memory formation, is linked to Alzheimer's disease, deteriorates in late adulthood, 
that higher fitness levels are associated with larger volume. This effect has been replicated numerous times throughout the literature. So uh, in children, nine to 10 year old children, higher fitness levels associated with larger hippocampal volume. In adolescents, uh, higher fitness levels associated with larger hippocampal volumes. In uh, early stage Alzheimer's disease patients, higher fitness levels associated with larger hippocampal volumes. In breast cancer survivors, higher fitness levels associated with larger hippocampal volumes. This has been repeated over and over again now. But like I said, despite how provocative and interesting this association is, it's an association. We cannot make any causal claims about these links. So the last few slides were focusing on the hippocampus. And a lot of my talk will be focused on the hippocampus. Uh, there's a lot of research focusing on the impact of physical activity and exercise on the hippocampus in humans. But that being said, there's many other brain areas that seem to be linked with physical activity and fitness. And so here is another correlation, just a cross-sectional study where we measured fitness levels and then examined how fitness was related to uh, volume of the, of the brain. And we found in all of these colored areas, and these areas are all predominantly in the prefrontal regions of the brain and along the medial wall, all of these areas, higher fitness levels were associated with greater volume of tissue in older adults. These same prefrontal areas are areas that are typically deteriorating in late adulthood. So like I said earlier, you can use neuroimaging techniques to examine a number of different uh, uh, parameters and aspects of brain health and function. Another parameter is to examine white matter. White matter are, are the axons, containing the axons, which are the tissue that allows the uh, different brain areas to connect and communicate to one another. So they're basically like the highways of the brain. And when we look across two different experiments now, we find that higher fitness levels are associated with greater white matter microstructure in older people in all of these colored areas in both experiments. So there seems to be quite a bit of consistency over and over again in cross-sectional studies at least that these associations exist. So, like I said, cross-sectional studies are provocative, they're interesting, but they have their limitations. So, what have the um, longitudinal studies shown? And if we take a step back and think about um, the, uh, uh, even take a step back, maybe from the neuroimaging studies themselves, what's happening in terms of risk for dementia or risk for cognitive impairment? Well, going back to the cross-sectional studies, we've known from at least the mid-1970s that older adults that are more physically active tend to outperform their less active peers on a whole variety of different cognitive tasks. And this general effect has been replicated numerous times. So that's from cross-sectional research. Longitudinal research has shown some fairly similar patterns. So in this study, this is a meta-analysis uh, uh, examining effects across uh, numerous studies, uh, over 33,000 individuals in this, in this study, and basically what they do is they measure physical activity and then they follow these people for many years and examine um, their rate of cognitive change, their rate of cognitive decline. And uh, what this study did was they, uh, they looked across all these studies and they found that greater amounts of physical activity were associated with about a 40% reduced risk of experiencing cognitive decline in late adulthood. Focusing in on a few of these studies, uh, uh, this is a, a paper, a well-known paper published in 2006, looking at uh, dementia rates. Um, and here you can see age during the study, and they roughly just divided the amount of physical activity into uh, greater than or equal to three times per week that, or less than three times per week. And basically, what you can see is those people who were physically active less than three times per week showed a greater, uh, more precipitous drop, basically, in uh, their, uh, their being free from dementia. So basically, risk for dementia was increased in the, um, 
uh, low active group. In this study, published in 2017 from the Framingham Heart Study, uh, here too they divided into quartiles and those individuals in the lowest quartile showed a much more accelerated rate of cognitive impairment over a 10 year span. So these are again provocative but again, we can't make any causal claims about this just yet. There have been studies longitudinally now also examining impact on brain volume and brain, different brain metrics. So in this particular study, we, uh, this was part of, part of the cardiovascular health study. Physical activity was assessed in 1989, 1990, and uh, about nine years later, uh, 300 of them came back and uh, they were cognitively normal. And, uh, and we had brain measures on them. So we were able to use this physical activity measure at this time point and predict brain volume nine years later. And then four years later, they were diagnosed either as cognitively normal or with MCI or dementia. And then we were able to examine uh, whether brain volume at this time point was also related to their diagnosis four years later. And what we found was very interesting. Uh, walking greater distances, walking greater amounts in 1989, 1990, was associated with greater brain volume in all of these older people nine years later in all of these areas, including the prefrontal cortex, the temporal cortex, and the hippocampus. I was very skeptical of this. This was a self-reported measure of physical activity collected in 1989, 1990, and then we're doing these brain volume measures nine years later. So we started to control for a whole variety of different measures, and whatever we basically put into the model here, this effect remained significant. So then what we did was we uh, took some of these areas and we divided, because we had 299 people in the study, we divided the groups into quartiles. And what we found uh, was um, a somewhat graded effect across the, uh, the lower three quartiles. Uh, some effect here, but then there was a jump up in each of these areas that you see here. So here's the hippocampus, you see graded effect, and then much, uh, a little bit of a jump up. So the question that you're probably asking is, is, well, how much activity is this group actually getting, this Q4 group? They are getting, now remember, this is a self-reported walking measure. They were self-reported walking about 72 blocks per week. So maybe about a mile a day. That's about how much that they were walking. So we took this data and then we uh, examined whether it was further related to uh, risk for cognitive impairment. And in fact, greater amount of tissue in these areas that were associated with greater amounts of walking were associated with a reduced risk of experiencing cognitive impairment four years later. So this was important because it linked for the first time physical activity at one point, gray matter volume at another point, and then risk for cognitive impairment a few years later. So it showed these associations, but again, as I keep repeating, we can't make any causal claims about this. So more recently, um, a postdoc of mine examined um, in the same cardiovascular health study links between physical activity and cognitive impairment and serum-derived levels or plasma-derived levels of amyloid, amyloid being one of the putative causal pathways by which people develop Alzheimer's disease. And what, what we found was that physical activity was indeed associated with cognitive impairment through changes in plasma uh, amyloid. So it seems as if physical activity might be uh, also associated with cognitive impairment through, through amyloid. But again, uh, this, was, uh, this is um, uh, a longitudinal assessment in which physical activity was not manipulated. And, uh, and so we have to be careful about the types of causal conclusions that we draw from a, a study like this. But it is, again, a provocative um, and interesting association. Okay, so we've covered now some cross-sectional studies. We've covered some uh, longitudinal studies. The meat here is really in the interventions. Now, unfortunately, um, as is the case in many developing and budding areas, there's fewer, there's less data and fewer studies that have been done in, in a randomized controlled nature. Most of the studies, as I've shown you, have been cross-sectional and longitudinal. But that being said, there have been a number of interventions, a number of them and, and, and more that have been going on. Uh, there have been more uh, interventions in the context of 
the influence of, of physical activity on cognitive outcomes. In the context of neuroimaging measures, there's, there's fewer of them. But um, let's think here, let's talk a little bit about interventions. So this is a, a famous meta-analysis conducted by my prior uh, uh, graduate advisor, Art Kramer, published in 2003. They took 18 randomized uh, clinical trials examining uh, cognitive outcomes. And they grouped the cognitive outcomes into roughly four different areas, four different domains and examined uh, whether participating or engaging in exercise was associated with improvements in any cognitive domain. And all of these studies, these 18 studies, all of these were done in older, healthy, cognitively normal, older individuals. And what you see here is that exercise uh, was associated with um, an improvement in all cognitive domains. So the one point that I want you to take home from this is that there seems to be a general effect of physical activity across a number of different cognitive domains. However, there's also some specificity. This is now being generally referred to as the selective enhancement hypothesis, that, that executive function seemed to be enhanced more from exercise than other cognitive domains. So executive functions being these higher level cognitive processes like working memory, uh, maintaining goals, cognitive flexibility, uh, um, all of these types of inhibition and selective attention, all of these are considered uh, executive functions. So this research uh, really pointed us to another area besides the hippocampus that might be really important and influenced by physical activity. The brain areas supporting executive function. That is the prefrontal cortex. Now I showed you some associations earlier that the prefrontal cortex is in fact correlated with physical activity and fitness. When we look across other meta-analyses, this is a meta-analysis of Alzheimer's disease patients. Here too, we see that cognition seems to be improved even in people with Alzheimer's disease. Now, this being said, these are two meta-analyses. I'm gonna come back to this really important point in just a little bit. Some meta-analyses fail to find significant effects of physical activity on cognitive outcomes. Why? It's an important point. I want you to keep that in mind because I'm gonna come back to that in a little bit. So let me, design, let me describe to you the general design of our exercise interventions that uh, I'm gonna be showing you some data from. So we bring in uh, older, relatively inactive adults to the laboratory. We do a variety of baseline assess assessments. So we do cardiorespiratory fitness testing. We put them into an MRI, MRI machine. We do cognitive testing and we get blood on them. We randomize them either to a brisk walking or stretching and toning control condition. So the similarities and differences between these two conditions is really critically important. Remember, this is an experimental manipulation. In any experimental manipulation, you want to keep everything identical between the two groups, except for the thing that you're trying to manipulate. And so here, both groups are receiving physical activity. Stretching and toning is a form of physical activity. We're doing this in a group format. Both groups come into the lab in a group format. They're getting the same amount of social interaction, which is important because some studies have found that social interaction also has an impact on cognitive and brain function. So we're making equivalent the amount of social interaction. They get the same amount of instruction from our health instructors and our, and our exercise trainers. They come into the lab for the same amount of time, three days per week for 30, 30 to 45 minutes. So the main differences here are the intensity and the type of physical activity. We monitor the heart rate and RPEs of these two groups. This group, we make sure that they're exercising at a moderate intensity level based on their heart rate. Stretching and toning, we make sure based on their heart rate that they're exercising in the light intensity zone. So the intensity and type of physical activity is really what's different between these two groups. We do this for six months or one year, and we bring everybody back for follow-up assessments. So here we are going to examine, we want to examine the effects of a randomized exercise intervention on changing hippocampal volume. I showed you all of this cross-sectional data earlier. These associations, those people who are higher fit show greater hippocampal volume. Those people who are more physically active, larger hippocampal volumes. 
can we modify the size of the hippocampus? Is this a region that, that is amenable to this type of change? So in this particular study, we had 120 people. Uh, we had, uh, this was roughly, this is the age in both groups. Uh, we had slightly more women in this group. All of the effects are gonna remain, uh, that I'm gonna show you remain significant even when controlling for any gender effects. Attendance was about 80% uh, in both groups and fitness improved in the walking exercise group over this 12 month period. So the fidelity of our intervention worked out, uh, it was, was high. We reliably improved uh, fitness in the walking exercise group compared to the stretching and toning group. Here's what happened in the brain. So I'm gonna show you three different areas. These are all volumetric assessments. The thalamus was, we used as a negative control area. We didn't expect anything to change in the, in the thalamus. Uh, uh, I don't know of any study that's really focused on the thalamus in the context of, of exercise, in rodent literatures. I don't really know of any studies in humans that are really focused on the thalamus. And certainly in the context of aging, if you see any age-related changes in the volume of the thalamus over a one-year period, you've got probably a lot to worry about. So generally, no one sees uh, changes in the volume of the thalamus over one year period and here in fact we didn't see any changes either and there was no difference as a function of group. The caudate nucleus we thought there might be some signal something happening. The caudate nucleus has a lot of uh, dopaminergic innervation. It's linked to Parkinson's disease. We know that uh, from a lot of animal studies and some studies in Parkinson's disease patients that physical activity likely influences the integrity and function of this region but this effect was not significant. So I'm not gonna to make too much out of that. What's really striking is what's happening here in the hippocampus. We see about a one and a half percent decline in those people who are in the stretching and toning group. This amounts to the normal age-related decline in the size of the hippocampus. Remember I told you earlier that the hippocampus in people over the age of 50 shows somewhere between a one and a two percent decline in this region. So this is consistent. But what's also striking is what's happening here in the walking group. This group is showing a linear increase in its size over this 12 month period. This increase amounted to about a 2% increase in this walking group. It might, might sound small, but 2% giving about a one to 2% per year decline in the size of the hippocampus, this amounts to almost reversing the clock by about one to two years. So 12 months of brisk walking was capable of altering the hippocampus in this fashion. What's really remarkable, I think, about this particular finding, well, there's two things, at least. One is that, in my opinion, this demonstrates a remarkable degree of plasticity in the hippocampus in older people. The brain remains amenable to change even in these older individuals that are generally experiencing atrophy and deterioration of the brain. So the older adult brain retains at least some of its capacity for brain plasticity. The second important part of this is that I don't know of any pharmaceutical intervention that's been able to demonstrate the same effect. So we took this data and we asked another question. We said, we asked, are the changes in the hippocampus, the size of the hippocampus, were they correlated at all with changes in cardiorespiratory fitness? And in fact, they were. So here you're seeing changes, positive increases, growth in the size of the hippocampus in the left hemisphere, the right hemisphere, and changes in VO2 max. And what you see is a significant correlation in both of these hemispheres, both these regions. So we see plasticity in the hippocampus. What about the rest of the brain? Well, we can measure the rest of the brain, the volume and function of the rest of the brain using many other techniques. We can measure cortical thickness, we can measure uh, volume in a number of different areas. One way is to take a brain, an MRI image, and strip off all of the non-brain tissue and segment it 
parcelate it into gray matter and white matter, and then we can examine on a point-by-point -point basis throughout the brain how the volume of tissue varies as a function of anything we're interested in. In this case, physical activity or fitness, exercise, anything. So in a six-month uh, intervention, uh, we found changes in the prefrontal cortex uh, along the medial wall, the anterior cingulate cortex, and the genu of the corpus callosum in the white matter tracts. One important thing here, notice, is that we're not seeing the entire brain just uniformly grow with engaging in physical activity. It's not just this general non-specific enlargement, same way that we didn't see it really in the caudate nucleus or the thalamus. We aren't seeing it globally here. We're seeing it in the prefrontal, primarily in the prefrontal regions. And when you start looking at the literature, the two areas that seem to pop up over and over again is the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus. It's not that other areas aren't affected, but at least those two areas seem to be the most consistent across the literature. So I mentioned to you earlier correlations with white matter. I showed you correlations between fitness, greater fitness levels are associated with greater white matter microstructure in older adults. What about an intervention? Unfortunately, there isn't much data on this. The few studies that have been conducted even suggest that maybe white matter may not be as amenable to change or at least it doesn't change as quickly as gray matter. So in this, uh, this is the result of, a, of, a, of an intervention, a randomized clinical intervention. We didn't see any main effects or interactions between time and group on white matter measures. However, when we broke apart the group, we found that those people who showed greater changes in fitness did indeed show greater increases in, white, in some white matter regions. So it may be dependent on the duration of the intervention. It may be dependent on the intensity of the intervention. It may be that white matter is, uh, is, the effects on white matter are a bit more protracted. There's a lot of questions here. We really simply just don't have, have the answers at this point. Another commonly used uh, measure for assessing brain health is assessing resting functional connectivity. So this is basically assessing uh, how connected and how, how different brain areas communicate to uh, one another. Now this is just a correlation matrix is essentially what it comes down to. So again, we aren't, we aren't saying that this brain region X is directly communicating to brain region Y, but we can say that they are functionally connected in the sense that they seem to be their time series uh, and signals seem to be correlated with one another. And then we can examine whether that the strength of that correlation changes across time or as a function of an exercise intervention. And here are results from two of these types of studies published in 2010. There have been a few others published since then. Uh, and what we see is increased, basically walking exercise, increases uh, connectivity between areas of the frontal cortex and the anterior cingulate and medial wall and the hippocampus. Here, the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus. So again and again, whether we're looking at volume studies or whether we're looking at more of these functional MRI outcomes, it seems that for whatever reason, the hippocampus and prefrontal cortex seem to be popping up. Why is an important question. So, um, and I'll come back to that question maybe at the end if I have enough time. So, important other, another important component to these data is that if you looked at the scatter plots, not everybody responds in the same way. We have some people who join our interventions, they come, they exercise, they're great subjects, they participate, and then they don't show any changes in the hippocampus. Why is that? Well, it's likely that there might be moderators, factors that are influencing how much the brain changes and cognition changes 
as a result of participating in exercise. And moderators can be thought of in a number of different ways. So for an example, let's say you go out for a run or for a brisk walk. You might be gaining some cognitive or brain changes, gaining something from going on that brisk walk or run. But if every time you go for a run, you stop to have a burger and a beer, any benefit that you might be getting from physical activity may be mitigated by your diet. So diet might be influencing the types of benefits that we see from physical activity. Another possibility, you go out for a run every day, you're gaining the benefits, your brain is seeing the benefits, but then you come home and you engage in some intellectually stimulating activity. Could this combination should, is engaging in intellectual stimula stimulation or intellectually stimulating activities, is this augmenting the effects of physical activity? Obviously, we don't live in an environment where we just do physical activity and that's it. We have many different factors that are influencing and probably influencing any benefits that we're getting from physical activity. An example here, an ex uh, a good example, I think is gender. So many studies have been finding that in older, especially in older people, but across the lifespan, there are benefits that seem to be greater for females. So first of all, interventions with more females tend to show larger effect sizes than studies with males. Females with mild cognitive impairment show greater benefits across a variety of cognitive tasks. Female rats show greater changes in capillary structure after exercise. In the health and retirement study, only females showed reduced depressive symptoms with greater amounts of physical activity. Greater physical activity was associated with reduced depressive symptoms only in females. This was a study out of my lab. However, there are some other studies showing greater benefits for males. So fitness effects are greater on white matter lesions only in males and ethanol induced depressive symptoms were mitigated by exercise, but only in males. So there seems to be some gender differences here. We don't know exactly why, but gender certainly seems to be a potential modifier of the effects of physical activity. Another example might be age. So here is a study that we published in 2003. We found that age was associated with uh, greater declines in gray matter and white matter volume, but that fitness moderated these effects of age. So here we get effects of fitness, but the modifier is age. And basically what we found is that the effects of fitness seem to be greater. They seem to be having a greater effect on gray matter volume measures than in younger younger age ranges. Genotype is another example, and my colleague uh, Carson here has done a lot of work on, on uh, the modifying effects of APOE genotype on, on the benefits seen in physical activity, and here's another study published from Denise Head. So here, let me explain what you're seeing here. This is mean cortical binding potential of amyloid. So uh, this is, you don't, want, you don't want amyloid in your brain. It's a marker for, at least a marker for Alzheimer's disease pathology. And uh, so higher bar here is something you don't want to have. These, this is uh, low amounts of people, or low amount of physical activity, high amounts of physical activity, low amounts, high amounts, separated by their, their E4 uh, genotypes. So these people are not carrying the risk allele for cognitive impairment. And this group is carrying the risk allele for cognitive impairment. You see this big bar. This is the bar that jumps off the screen at everyone, right? What is this group? This group is the people that are at risk for cognitive impairment based on their gen genotype, but it's the low physical activity in combination with the E4 risk group that shows this greater amount of amyloid. This is interesting, but what I actually find the most interesting about this figure is what's happening right here. Basically, this group is showing a genetic risk for high amounts of amyloid and a greater risk for Alzheimer's disease, but engaging in greater amounts, higher amounts of physical activity essentially mitigated or trumped the effect of the polymorphism on amyloid levels.
This has also been found uh, in other, for other polymorphisms. So uh, in a study that we published in 2013, uh, a gene called the brain-derived neurotrophic factor, gene BDNF, it codes for a protein called BDNF. Uh, it's known to be uh, linked with cognitive function, but here too we found that uh, the effect of the polymorphism on cognitive function was only apparent in those people getting low amounts of physical activity. Once we started looking at people getting high amounts of physical activity, there was no effect of the polymorphism on any measure of cognitive performance. So, moderation. Here's the challenge that we face. Most of these studies on moderators have been done in cross-sectional studies. These studies that I just showed you were cross-sectional in nature. Part of the problem that we have is that generally you need larger sample sizes in order to really test for interactions. And so most RCTs just don't, simply don't have the sample size to really reliably test for these uh, possible moderators. There might be other moderators. So for an example, there we showed uh, in 2007 that maybe hormone therapy use is playing a role, omega-3 intake, we could think about baseline fitness or physical activity levels, duration or intensity of activity, intellectual stimulation as I mentioned earlier, and so on. So up to now, we've been talking really a bit more about the phenomenology of the effects. And what I mean by that is we're describing the effects. Um, we haven't, I haven't mentioned yet anything about possible pathways or mechanisms. Have people tried to assess this? Have people tried to assess um, whether these volumetric changes are just meaningless byproducts of engaging in physical activity? Or do they have some mechanistic role in behavioral improvements? Do they have some importance? for things that we really care about because we don't, who cares about the brain if there's no benefit to behavior? Now, obviously, we're studying the brain because I do think, and I think we have all good reasons to think that the brain and brain volume is important. If I took a poll in here and said, if I took away half your brain, would you be upset about that? Most of you would probably say yes, right? You, you want to keep your brain healthy, you want to maintain the volume, and so uh, keeping a healthy brain is important. But what are the mechanisms? And we can think about mechanisms on multiple levels. And this is an important, an important component here that I want, to, I want to talk about, because usually when we talk about mechanisms, we think automatically right away to molecular and cellular pathways. And that's perfectly fine. And, and in fact, we can think, we can ask the questions, what are the molecular and cellular changes that are taking place that influence either these structural and functional brain changes or maybe psychosocial changes like sleep patterns or anything else or changes in cognitive function. So molecular and cellular changes is certainly a, an important factor, a, a, a component in the pathway by which we want to think about physical activity and these behavioral changes. But we can also think about how do these structural and functional brain changes that we see in relation to physical activity, how do they mediate these psychosocial and cognitive changes? And similarly, maybe when we think about cognitive changes and cognitive improvements resulting from physical activity, maybe, just maybe, we are seeing improvements in cognitive function because people are sleeping better. And maybe it's because people are sleeping better that people are able to think better. Or maybe people are approaching the world differently. Their affect is changed. Their mood is changed. So they're performing these cognitive tasks differently. So in that case, mood or sleep or these psychosocial changes would be significant mediators for the link between physical activity and cognitive function. Now, of course, all of these are dependent on one another. We wouldn't expect to see structural and functional brain changes in the absence of molecular and cellular changes. Of course, something has to be happening on that, on that fundamental level. So these are not mutually exclusive of one another. And in fact, exercise increases a number of cellular and molecular pathways, including the number of neurons in the hippocampus. 
an important molecule called brain-derived neurotrophic factor. It's critically involved in learning and memory. It's involved in cell proliferation. It's found in high concentrations in the hippocampus. Guess what? In people with Alzheimer's disease, if you look at people in, in, in people with Alzheimer's disease where pathology is found, no BDNF is found. Exercise increases BDNF levels. In humans, going back to my prior study in 2011, those people that showed greater increases in hippocampal volume showed greater increases in BDNF levels. Similarly, functional connectivity measures. Changes in functional connectivity are correlated with changes in serum-derived BDNF levels. So, and here again, sorry, I forgot about this one, here again, uh, BDNF levels, changes in BDNF levels across the course of an intervention mediated improvements in executive function. So we are starting to target certain cellular and molecular pathways in changes in cognition, changes in brain, and, uh, and starting to understand the links between these neuroimaging measures and cognitive outcomes. So the limitations here, most studies look at correlations and do not statistically test for mediation. Most have small sample sizes that limit our ability to test for mediation. And this is unlikely to be driven by one primary mediator. So there's, we have to be thinking broadly about cerebral vascular changes, inflammation, insulin pathways, blood pressure, et cetera. So in conclusion, we can think here, coming back to a point that I made earlier, how consistent are the effects? This is a, a meta-analysis published in 2015. We found no evidence in the available data that aerobic physical activities, including those that successfully improve cardiorespiratory fitness, have any cognitive benefit in cognitively healthy older adults. The Institute of Medicine, in the same year, produced a document based on the literature, and they said that uh, physical activity is one of the, or maybe the most promising approach that we have for improving cognitive function in older people. There's a lot of discrepancy and muddiness across the literature. Why is that? Okay, so let me quickly go through a few different discrepancies that seem to be plaguing the literature. Many RCTs have small sample sizes. This could lead to spurious positive findings or could be related to insufficient power if people don't have the sample sizes and we're seeing just modestly sized effects Having larger sample sizes could be important. Variability in monitoring, activity and adherence, compliance, supervised versus home-based. You can see a lot of variability in adherence rates, some down to less than 40%. Many trials do not include intent to treat protocols, fail to report blinding during assessments. Many studies fail to report baseline physical activity levels or don't include activity levels as eligibility criteria. There's variability in the duration of the intervention from four weeks to 18 months. Studies that don't take these factors into consideration could be missing a lot. There's variability in the intensity of the intervention. Some studies fail to monitor or assess fitness or objectively monitor activity. Uh, there's variability in the types of control conditions and meta-analyses often combine across all of these when in fact we have good reason to believe that uh, stretching and toning might be different than, um, than education and wait list and depending on how the papers analyze their data you could get different, different results. Lack of assessment of individual differences or moderators, variability in the quality of cognitive assessments that are done. And so there's a lot of uh, reasons for some uh, discrepancies in this literature. And meta-analyses sometimes combine different types of physical activity interventions that are likely influencing the brain in different ways. So there's many unanswered questions. How long do these effects persist? This is probably a very important question that all of you are asking. Sure, all of these effects happen, but we stop exercising for a lot of different reasons. How long do these effects persist? We really don't have the answer. What types of exercise are most effective? The mode of exercise, we don't know. Dose response effects. And what do these volumetric differences reflect on a cellular level? So we've, uh, we are conducting, as, as Carson said earlier, we are conducting a phase three clinical trial to address some of these questions. And we are collecting a lot of measurements, including amyloid and body composition, to try to understand the effects of the dose response of physical activity on brain and cognitive outcomes in healthy, older adults, and also examine potential moderators, genetic moderators, and mechanisms.
Um, with that, we've learned a lot about the impact of certain behaviors on brain outcomes. And we can be pretty confident that we know that exercise and physical activity does a lot for the brain, but we still have a lot to learn. So coming back to the silly putty, the brain still retains its capacity for some plasticity, even when it's old. So exercise has widespread effects on the brain. Moderate intensity exercise several days a week is sufficient for improving brain health. Starting to exercise in late life is not futile. Even those who are sedentary can improve function. And exercise may have long-term health consequences for many different diseases and conditions of the brain. So in conclusion, I just want to thank my team because uh, this really takes a whole village of people to do this work. Uh, all of my funding agencies and my collaborators, many of which I, I don't have enough room to really uh, even put on this, on this slide. So um, I, with that, I just want to thank you for your attention. Thank you.